Hello, loyal listeners. This is Tom Parry, the other Tom from the Right on Track podcast here. As you may have noticed, we haven't really been releasing any new episodes lately. So to make up for that, we have put together a series of Thomas the Tank Engine short stories, which have been written and produced by none other than our own Tom Denham. Hope you enjoy. Steam Tram and the Brake Van. Percy groaned as the heat of the sun scorched his boiler. Summer was well and truly afoot on the island of Sodor, but work did not stop for the engines on Thomas's branch line. Percy marshalled empty trucks to the quarry for them to be filled with stone, and Mavis and Toby would take them back to the main line. Most of these full trucks would then become a part of big heavy goods trains hauled by the likes of Henry, Donald or Douglas. Percy had to work extra hard to ensure that the quarry had enough empty trucks to fill up the stone again, but the more trips he took, the more difficult his day became. Stone quarry trucks had a well-known reputation for being the rudest of them all. Don't try and cross a train of quarry trucks, Henry would remind Percy. They can be destructive if not treated properly. Percy frowned at his line of trucks. The truck closest to the front gave Percy a very sly grin without saying a single word. The trip was long and arduous, but Percy finally made his way to the quarry. He started backing his trucks into one of the sidings. You took your time, pouted Mavis. Percy was quick to answer. It's these trucks. Henry said they can be destructible. Toby laughed. Are you sure that's what he said? I know what Henry said. Henry knows a thing or two about trucks and I want to hear him out. But Percy was interrupted by a thud, a whistle and a splintering noise. He had reversed too far back, crashing the buffers and damaging the brake van. Luckily, the guard had jumped clear before the accident had occurred, but he was very cross. Just look what you've done, you silly engine, scolded the guard, and that brake van was newly painted too. The quarry manager came to see what was the matter. We were counting on using that brake van too. Now Toby can't leave without a full train. He's right, a train can't go without a brake van, added Mavis, who had learned a lot recently about taking trains outside the parameters of the quarry. I'll call the yard manager at Tidmouth and see what he can arrange, the quarry manager decided. Meanwhile, Toad the Brake Van stood solitarily in a siding, watching engines go back and forth, all looking rather confident and cheerful. He let out an audible sigh as the bird that sat on his roof flew away. Suddenly, Duck the Great Western Engine slowly came to couple up behind him. Good news, Toad, said Duck's driver. Seems as though you need it on the branch line. Oh, thank you. It would be so good to see Mr. Oliver again. He's been so occupied with summer passenger services. I've longed for a nice coastal run. Duck replied, What do we say about Oliver? You'll be visiting Thomas's branch line today. Thomas's branch line? Oh, what would they need with an old brake van like me? It was the yard manager's turn to put in. There's been an accident at Anofa Quarry. They're in need of a brake van right away, and you're the only one that's available. Toad was happy to be working, but he longed to see his lifelong friend. Duck and Toad pulled into the quarry, where they were greeted by Mavis and Toby. We're glad you're here to help, chimed Mavis. These trucks can be a lot of trouble, but we've heard that you're a rather reliable brake van. Toad was reluctant. I'll do my best, he said. He was shunted into a siding by Duck, who gave him a parting toot-toot on his whistle as he rolled away. Mavis darted from one side of the yard to the other, arranging a long line of trucks. As the trucks increased in number, the more troublesome they became. 
Oh, look, is that told? One twittered. The brake van that was saved from the scrapyard, said another. I heard some trucks slowed him a thing or two when he became a leader, scowled the front truck. And they pushed him into a muddy pond, barked the last. <laughs> the trucks laughed. Don't listen to them, sympathised Toby. Trucks can be troublesome, and it's best to keep an eye on them. Toad was offended. He knew all too well about trucks and wasn't prepared to be told what to do by an engine who he didn't know. Thank you for your advice, Mr. Toby, but I will have these trucks under control, thank you. Toby tried to forget this, but the more he thought about Toad's intolerance towards him, the crosser he became. At last, the train was ready to leave. Toby pulled the insufferable trucks out of the quarry as they tried as hard as they could to hold back. You can't give in to their pulling, Toad advised, but he was soon cut off. Thank you, Toad, but I know what I'm doing. It wasn't like Toby to be so easily flustered, but he was certain that there weren't going to be any accidents today. As they pulled out onto the branch line, the heat got to the trucks, Toad and Toby. The tram engine doesn't like you, a truck whispered. You should show him a thing or two and hold back when we next try a trick. The trucks were fully aware that if they tried to pin down their brakes that Toby would keep on pulling forward until they stopped. Their chance came when they reached the top of the shore's incline. Hold back, hold back, the trucks screamed. Toad thought this was the right opportunity to apply his brakes, but Toby kept on pulling. Then it happened. A coupling snapped, leaving Toad stranded on top of the hill, unbeknownst to Toby. Goods trains weren't usually scheduled to stop at passenger stations, but most have platform speed restrictions that engines need to adhere by. Toby slowed down as he pulled into Ellsbridge. The station master monitored the platform as the long train snaked its way in and out of the station. Then he shouted, Stop! Stop! You can't leave here without a brake van! Toby had obviously misheard, to which he replied, I don't want to hear about that brake van again! A red signal then shot up in front of him. Whatever now, he fumed. Toby rang his bell to challenge the signal. Sorry, said the signalman, but I'm afraid you're not allowed to pass unless you have a brake van. A train can't travel without one. The driver and fireman looked at the back of the train, noting the absence of Toad and the guard. The coupling must have snapped on that grade back there, quizzed the fireman, scratching his head. And he was right. As Toby slowly backed in the direction he had come from, there was Toad, sitting on top of the grade waiting for them. Toby felt awful. I'm sorry, Toad. I shouldn't have pulled so hard. No, Mr. Toby, I'm sorry I didn't listen to you in the first place. I shouldn't have listened to those trucks. We both know that trucks can be troublesome, that's for sure, laughed Toby. So maybe we should make sure that we just listen to each other, Toad replied. For the rest of the journey, Toby and Toad travelled safely and kept the trucks in order. As they pulled into Tidmouth, Henry was waiting and was very impressed by how quiet the trucks were. I know you're both good with trucks, started Henry, but I didn't know you were this good. Oh, didn't you know, Mr. Henry? It's easy, said Toad. But you must be careful. Trucks can be destructible, Toby laughed as he and his new friend went away, leaving the big green engine lost for words.
The Trouble with Coaches. As the quarry was in demand of help, Thomas had to take on Toby's passenger services as well as his own. Each morning, he had to take an extra early service to get the workmen to the quarry and then a late service to get them home again. This, however, meant that Henrietta was not needed. She sat in the coach sidings at Knapford, hankering to be taken out again. Other coaches would come and go, but she remained where she sat. Is it my turn to go out? She asked Thomas longingly. Sorry, Henrietta, but these coaches are for James, he replied solemnly. Suddenly, the yard manager came running towards them with a piece of paper. Is there a spare coach available? He asked. There's one needed on the Arlesborough branch. They have an overflow of passengers and need some help right away. Thomas looked around the coach sidings. The only suitable coach is Henrietta, he responded. Then she'll have to do. Duck has just taken Toad down to a Nova quarry, but is due to return promptly. He's just passed through Ellsbridge. When he arrives, I'll have him take you to Tidmouth. Henrietta was elated with this news. Duck and Henrietta arrived to meet Oliver, the other great western engine. He was waiting at the station platform with his other two coaches, Isabel and Dulcie. These passengers keep on coming, Oliver began. All the makers are wanting to go on the beaches on our line and we had not enough coaches to carry them all, but thanks to you now we do. I'd be happy to help, Henrietta replied. She was soon coupled to the front of the train where she met Dulcie, who was dozing in the hot summer sun. She suddenly awoke. Ooh, look here, Izzy. Another coach. She's not in our livery, though. You don't need a matching livery to be a full train. I normally travel with Victoria and Elsie, and they don't match me at all, but we all get on. No, I don't know how you can be so ignorant, stuttered Dulcie the coach. Isabel who decides not to speak, gave her bell a ding-a-ling. Dulcie sneered. I think you've offended her. You must remember, when we arrived on Solar, Dulcie, that Isabel wore a very different paintwork to what you have now, Oliver put in. It's obvious, started Dulcie, that Henrietta here is a second-rate excuse for a coach. Even though we are branch-line coaches, we still have a reputation to obtain. Henrietta decided to ignore Dulcie, and they soon got on with the work. The holiday makers were enough of a distraction for the three coaches to enjoy their day, but it didn't stop Dulcie from quietly seething between journeys. How dare she join our train and ruin our image? As Dulcie sulked at Isabel, who still decided to remain quiet, Henrietta started ruining the plan. Oliver parked the coaches that evening at Knapford, where the other coaches were staying. Toodaloo, he cried, as he went to go join the other engines at the washdown. It wasn't long until Dulcie and Isabel were both asleep. Soon enough, Thomas parked Gordon's express coaches in a siding. Hello, remarked Thomas, you seem troubled. It's that Dulcie, she's too worried about her reputation, and that I'll worry about her image. Thomas laughed. <laughs> That's no way for a coach to behave. Henrietta got Thomas's attention and proposed her plan. Thomas chuckled at the idea and agreed to help. The next morning, Dulcie awoke as she was coupled to Oliver. A very enthusiastic voice exclaimed, Hello, Dulcie! Dulcie's eyes darted from left to right. Standing next to her was a coach much akin to Henrietta, are wearing a yellow livery. Oh, I'm Hannah. I'm going to be helping you and Henrietta today. Dulcie was alarmed. Where's Isabel gone? It was Thomas's turn to put in. Isabel is having her routine maintenance today. Dulcie fumed. Soon Oliver was steaming up at the station, baking in, in the warm sun, as passengers idled their way up to the platform. Oh, look, said a little girl. Look at those two coaches. They look so nice with their yellow and brown colours. But look over there, said a boy, pointing to Dulcie. She doesn't match with the other two at all. Dulcie had never felt so offended. She often basked in her great western colours, but today wasn't that day. 
The guard blew his whistle when waved the green flag, signaling to Oliver that it was time to depart. With a sudden lurch, it was Hannah who released her brakes the quickest. Oliver lurched forward, with the weight of the three coaches and the passengers shooting him out of the station like a rocket. Hannah was having the time of her life. Henrietta remained quietly satisfied, but Dulcie was feeling very uncomfortable. Oliver and the coaches sped down the line at a disconcerting speed. He slammed on his brakes as the train came to a grinding halt. Dorsey was expecting the guard to come marching out to lecture Oliver just how to pull his train, but her rush of thoughts were interrupted by a roar of laughter from Oliver, Hannah and Henrietta. A familiar figure walked towards the train. Well, Oliver, began Sir Topham Hatt, I didn't take you as an engine who are part-taking tomfoolery, but I won't tolerate this kind of nonsense in such a busy period of my railway. You could have injured one of your passengers. I'm sorry, sir, said Oliver glumly. Henrietta was next to speak. It was actually my fault, sir. Sir Topham Hatt was flabbergasted. I felt hurt by the things Dulcie said to me yesterday, so... I thought she ought to have a lesson. That, regards to Topham Hat, is not the way to deal with a problem. I would appreciate it if such matters were dealt with in a more professional way. I won't have my passengers being bounced around like peas in a frying pan. The service had to continue, but the following day, Isabel rejoined Oliver along with Hannah while Dulcie and Henrietta were to remain in the yard until told otherwise. I'm so sorry I was so stuck up, Dulcie finally declared. It's quite all right, replied Henrietta. I understand that you have a position to keep up, but maybe our ideas of such things are different to one another. And you show me that looks aren't everything. It's what you do to make your branch line great, remarked Dulcie. You're right, said Henrietta, and at the end of the day, all of our branch lines connect together and are a part of the same railway. The North Western Railway.
fitter's orders. The fat controller had many engines on his railway for many various jobs. They were stationed on particular routes or lines. However, when an engine is ill or is being repaired, someone must quickly go in their place to ensure that all scheduled services still run accordingly. This today was the case for Percy, the small green engine on Thomas's branch line. He was due for routine maintenance, so Derek was to take his place. Derek was mainly used as a mainline inspection diesel as he easily strained himself out. Today, Derek had to visit the dairy where a line of milk tankers were waiting for him. He idled his way into the siding looking rather worn out. Daisy, the diesel rail car, observed. The driver got out of the cab onto the platform. We've given you plenty of try runs on the stretch of the main line, he started. Soon enough, you'll find your strength to pull a proper train again, just as you were designed to do. A shunter coupled the milk tankers to Derek. The engine crew walked down the platform to the station to buy themselves some tea and cakes while they had the opportunity for a small break. I don't know how much of this I can take, he said to himself. What do you mean? asked Daisy. I've got teething troubles, you know. It means I can't push myself too hard. Daisy scoffed. Oh, diesel engines like you and I shouldn't have to pull too much. It's bad for our swerves. Derek blinked. What do you mean, swerves? Oh, haven't you heard? began Daisy. It's Fisher's orders. He told me to never, never pull. As Daisy was speaking, Philip, the diesel box cab, buffered up a milk tanker behind her. At the very instant touch of the buffers, Daisy roared. Excuse me, little engine, you mustn't buffer those trucks up to me. But, 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 Philip started and didn't know what he was going to say and was rather daunted by the looming presence of an angry diesel rail car. Leave those tankers for Toby, he can fuss around with them later. Philip made himself scarce. Derek, on the other hand, was quietly impressed. His crew eventually came back bearing a full pot of tea and an assorted array of cakes for the journey. Take it from another engine, Derek. Diesel to diesel. We shouldn't be forced to strain ourselves beyond what we can pull. Derek's concentration was scattered as the guard blew his whistle and waved the green flag and left the station in a hurry. Goodbye, Derek, and remember what I said, called Daisy from behind. Derek was having a good run for the most part. He glided through stations and yards, honking his horn to engines as they went by. They made it into Knapford Station in good time, but Derek was starting to quake. The station master approached the engine crew. Bearers had to take special goods trains to the other railway and has had to leave his passenger service. Do you think that you'll be able to cover it? Well, we finished Percy's milk delivery, so it seems all good for us, assured the driver. I'm not so sure about this, muttered Derek, looking at the red and cream bogey coaches. Come on, boy, comforted his driver. This will be a good run for you. The passengers filed into the coaches as the guard blew the whistle and waved the green flag, and Derek shot off in a hurry, hoping that it would all be over soon. It was all well and good until we arrived at Gordon's Hill. Oh, grease and oil, not this hill again. Derek strained up the grade as his wheels spun faster. His engine coughed and spluttered, and then there was trouble. That's torn it, said his driver. We'll have to call for help. A message was sent to the nearest signal box to warn engines travelling up the line. Much to his distaste, it was James to rescue the train. Stuff and nonsense, that's what all you diesels are, he retorted as he pulled the angry passengers away. Oko, the friendly diesel, towed Derek back to the sheds, where Fitter was waiting to look over his engine. Gordon and James had some things to say which Derek tried his best to blur out of his conscience, but he felt somewhat better after receiving some reassuring smiles from Edward, the old engine. As he went to sleep, he thought about what Daisy had said.
The next day, Derek entered the yard, ready to have another try at his passenger train. Unfortunately, there were no shunting engines about to fetch his coaches, so he had to find his own. As Derek slanked around the coach sidings, he remembered how fiercely Daisy got her way. He unfortunately wasn't capable of carrying passengers without a coach in tow, so that was out of the question. Derek thought and thought about what he could do until he had a bright idea. These coaches are awfully too small to carry all of us, one said. This surface is bound for Fickerstown. There's surely not enough room for everybody, cried another. Derek was blinded by his ego, thinking about how good of an idea it was to use the old branch line coaches instead of the express coaches he should have taken. Sheepishly, the guard departed the train with passengers crammed inside. <laughs> Derek happily hummed along the main line, feeling very good about himself. His sprightly mood was interrupted as a stern figure stood on the platform of the next station. Derek, began the fat controller, I thought I could trust you by taking care of Bear's passenger service, but all you've done is cause confusion and delay. Oh, I'm dreadfully sorry, sir, whimpered Derek. I was struggling to pull the coaches that I was given, so I thought getting a, a lighter load would ease the tension. They say it's bad for my swerves, you know. The fat controller paused impressively. It seems, he began, that you have been influenced by those who seem to have a particular disposition about pulling trains. I would advise you listen to my guidance only, have I made myself clear. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir, but what do I do about my train? I'm worried that if I pull too much that my wheels might just slip too far. The fat controller turned and smiled. You may have just answered your own question there, Derek. Derek was clueless. We can use the slip coaches for your train. They're mostly used in this summer period and will be perfect to ease your tension on your haulage capacity. And so it was arranged. The slip coaches were happy to put to work and make sure that they made the journey easy for Derek. As they arrived at each station, Derek could continue running happily as each coach was decoupled. Even Boko was impressed. I didn't think, he said to Edward one day, that Derek of all diesels could pull a passenger train so gracefully. Daisy, on the other hand, was not so happy. The fat controller had seen to it that she pulled milk tankers in addition to her usual passenger service until told otherwise. Derek is now careful about the advice that is given to him and knows to listen to the word of the fat controller, but he was always left puzzled if swerves actually existed.